When a large part of a nation's wealth comes from unproductive, unearned income, we call it a rentier economy. The entrenched land wealth of Britain's aristocracy is just one aspect of Britain's rentier economy. The rivers of easy money flowing through the city of London are the other aspect. And we can credit Willie the Conqueror for that too. In 1066, when William was busy marauding the land, he stopped short of the square mile we know of today as the City of London. This tiny area already had a strong working democracy. So instead of conquering it, Willie vowed to protect its independence. The City of London is today the oldest continuous democratic commune in the world. This special status as a nation within a nation allows it to function independently from the larger nation surrounding it, and more importantly, to bypass many of its laws. This tiny area has its own mayor, its own police, its own laws, and its own courts to defend those laws. Its electorate is dominated by private businesses. Its Lord Mayor is selected by medieval guilds. They even have their own permanent representative in the House of Commons. During the height of the British Empire, the wealth of the colonies flowed through this sovereign city-state. Hence it became a powerful banking and financial center. But as the empire declined, the city was threatened with collapse as one by one, the colonies gained their independence. The nail in the coffin was in 1956, when Egypt nationalized the Suez Canal. As a result, the pound sterling plunged. So in a desperate attempt to protect their collapsing currency, the government stepped in to stop the banks from lending overseas. But by then, the banks were quite powerful, and they were not happy. They discovered a loophole. Euro dollars is the name used for U.S. dollars held in banks outside the U.S. The use of these euro dollars originated in the Cold War. The Russians wanted to keep some U.S. dollars, but they didn't want to keep them in U.S. banks. So the banks created the London euro dollar market, and it was designed to bypass the rules. As dollars are considered to be a foreign currency, the Bank of England agreed that this money didn't affect the internal money supply, therefore didn't need to be regulated. So the market was run with informal, unwritten rules maintained through the English Old Boy Network. The English class system instills an impenetrable loyalty amongst its elites through its special privileged educational institutions known as public schools, which curiously are not public. Go figure. There's no need for incriminating paperwork when your handshake and your word is as good as a contract. This honor amongst the English elite is the glue, which has played a large part in passing down entrenched wealth throughout the generations. Another word is conspiracy, but that's a word that'll get you laughed out of the pub. (laughs) <laughs> Realizing they could operate free from regulation, U.S. banks began to move their operations into the city of London, and the euro market grew rapidly. By 1980, it had reached $500 billion. In 1988, $4.8 trillion. By 1997, 90% of all international loans went through the city. The remaining colonies were turned into tax havens. But these tax havens were devastating to some of the world's poorest countries. They became safe storage places for dictators, despots, and traffickers. Between 1970 and 2008, $944 billion in African money moved offshore. A lot of this money was stolen from the African people by their dodgy leaders. This $944 billion equals about five times Africa's foreign debt, which was $177 billion in 2008. Today, the Cayman Islands is the fifth largest financial center in the world, with $1.9 trillion in deposits for a land with a population of only 60,000. It has been estimated that half of all global offshore wealth may be hidden in the British-controlled network. London has more banks than any other financial center in the world. 
pretty soon, Easy Money became the only game in town. There was Easy Money from property, Easy Money from the city, the stock markets, and then there was the North Sea oil discovery. Manufacturing was by now nearly dead. Hey, why bother making things when you can make easy money in the city of London? Yeah, yeah. So Britain shifted into a financial monoculture, put the final nail in the coffin for manufacturing, and became dependent and addicted to the easy money. This concludes part two of England's Mask. Come back next week for part three. Please like this video, tell all your mates, and subscribe to the channel.